Welcome. Well, thanks for hanging in there for the last session of a very long day here at the Nakin Manual Conference. Um, our session today is how judges are mastering the shift from paper to electronic files. This is the second version. There was a 1015 version this morning that turned out very well, is very well attended. Um, before we introduce our presenters today, it's a couple of business issues that we need to take care of. Um, one is if this is a CLE opportunity for anyone, there are CLE forms available on the NACOM website and also at the registration desk at the end of the hall. Um, also, this is a recorded session, but we don't have a traveling mic, unfortunately, today to use. So if you could add a comment or question, if you could speak up real loud so the judges could hear you, and they will repeat your question into the microphone so we get that recorded for everyone who will be watching later. Um, my name is Clay Gavin. I'm the clerk of the Iowa District Court for Dubuque County, Iowa. Um, here with us today are two judges who have made the transition from paper to electronic. Um, to my far left is Judge Amy Clark Meacham from the state of Texas. And to my immediate left, Judge Mark Singer from the state of Florida. And please join me in welcoming them to the conference. Thank you, everyone, and good afternoon. We know this has been a long day. You started early uh, this morning. We appreciate every one of you who is in attendance to hear about our various experiences in uh, having an electronic courtroom. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Mark Singer. I'm a county judge in Manatee County, Florida. We have a population of about 330,000 uh, people. Uh, that makes us a moderate-sized community. Turned out it was ideal for um, be essentially beta testing um, a uh, court view system that we're going to be talking about today. I was appointed to the bench by then Governor Jeb Bush in 2005, and uh, first thing I did was ask our clerk of the court, who's very technology-oriented, to please explain why there's no computer in my courtroom, because I was used to the federal system, which is now called PACER, and I wanted to be able to see everything electronic. Well, we have had a, a good bonding relationship since then because I've been essentially a paperless courtroom since 2005, which is well in advance of, of most courtrooms. Every once in a while, I'll have an attorney from Hillsborough County, and we have some people from Hillsborough here, bring some young attorneys down to show them what a courtroom that does not have files in it looks like. And uh, it's been quite an uh, interesting uh, transition. Uh, we're here today to talk about um, some of the issues that you as court managers uh, are going to face as you transition into a paperless courtroom. And I'm Amy Clark Meacham. I'm a district court judge in Travis County, Texas. That's Austin, Texas. And we are um, now, I think Austin is now the ninth largest city in the country. It is growing incredibly fast. It is a million plus <coughs> county now. Um, I am a relatively new judge and I'm relatively new to the Smart Bench dashboard um, that you were gonna show and demonstrate for you today. Judge Singer's been using it for a long time. I've only been using it for about, well, I think it's three and a half months. Um, but I will tell you, uh, given that we started our morning in the plenary where we were talking about the different generations, um, as a firmly Gen Xer, um, I never lived in a world where I didn't have, really since junior high, where I wasn't doing my classwork and later my work on a computer. So by the time I was practicing law, I was at a large firm doing civil litigation, and all of our systems were computer-based systems. So uh, I'm sort of the, what, you mean you really, you want the paper? Like, I mean, that is my reaction to um, when people still have paper files, it takes me a second to go, oh, really? I, I, I adjust to that. So. Um, I, I have a perspective, I guess, on some level of not being particularly technology savvy. Um, the reason I'm in charge of the technology with my fellow judges is because our judge that's retiring this year, who, who was in charge of all of it, he needed a stand-in for him, and they simply looked around the room and said, oh, you're the one under 40. <laughs> and that was really, that was my only, I have no training in technology. I was a 
political science, liberal arts person all the way. I don't speak in terms of bits and bytes. I speak in terms of paper and pages and documents. On the other hand, I also speak in terms of I want my answer right now as somebody who really, even while the time I was in law school, remember, we were already key siding, except for a few people who still believed shepherdizing was better. Um, I was already using Westlaw. I understood the concept at that point that I could actually get the document quicker through Westlaw than through the books. And so on some level, there is a level when judges sort of matriculate and retire and more Gen Xers become uh, judges. I think you're going to see more people like me, people who just maybe we don't understand the technology, we don't need to, uh, we have IT people for that. That's my kind of uh, line on that. I know how to reboot. That's what they tell me to do always, just reboot. Um, but I still like to use the product and I want my information quickly. So, and I, I do civil and family, really no criminal. I, I do a general jurisdiction court, uh, but by local agreement, I do primarily civil and family. Um, so you're gonna get that perspective from me here today. Well, I have uh, four children and uh, four and three and a half, we have one on the way, grandchildren. And uh, I did not go through schooling with any kind of computer devices at all. I have in my office an old 1984 Mac, the standalone Mac that needs all the accessories, the floppy disk and the like, and people come in and look at it and say, are you kidding me? Where did you get that? Well, my brother is the geek of the family and I learned from my children. They're the ones that taught me. And uh, I'm also really not a, a how does that work kind of person. Um, if it's broken, turn it off, pull out the plugs, make sure everything's plugged in, turn it back on, see what happens. And then call Jeff or Greg. You know, those are my kids. You know, All right, I want to tell you what I'm looking at here. Tell me what's going on. And uh, once Greg said, well, Dad, what you've got is the blue screen of death. And I said, well, what's the blue screen of death? He says, it's too late if you've got it. <laughs> I hope you backed everything up. And fortunately, I said, yes, I do back up. He said, that's a good thing because your hard drive is toast. It's done. You need another hard drive. Um, Seth Madison made a very excellent presentation this morning. And where I want to start off, <clears throat> because most of you are court managers, who are going to have to steer the ship to the judges as to how to transition to a paperless courtroom, I want to talk about a couple of things that, that he brought up. Um, the good news is that the tipping point in technology is here. Uh, E-filing is becoming the wave throughout the country. For those of you in the jurisdictions that have it, you understand what I'm talking about. For those of you that don't have it yet, but they're all talking about it, <clears throat> essentially what it means, of course, is that the clerks will be receiving documents electronically and that's automatically gonna put the paper files that all of us were used to real, relying on, it's gonna put them out of business. They're not gonna have to store the paper files anymore. And the reason is pure economics. The clerk is not going to print out all the scan, all the documents that are coming in electronically and put them in a court file. Well, you need extra clerks to do that. And second, mistakes could be massive in that copying and putting the documents in the files. So the files are going away. <clears throat> That's the good news. The bad news is it's happening faster and faster. I know that all of you are aware of the fact that the changes in our technology from um, standalone computer, desktop computers, to laptops, to tablets has just gone faster and faster and faster. Look what's going on with the, with the cell phones. All of a sudden we've all got smart, smartphones. The whole younger world is using Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, where none of that was, was familiar to anyone just a few short years ago. And this is what's happening not only here in the court system, in the medical system, you're seeing everyone go to electronic files, and in real estate, uh, my wife works for Caldwell Banker, they've just gone through a massive change with the MLS system, everything is being done online, everything is being signed online. And so a lot of it has to do with attitude. One way to look at it is you're not going paperless, you're going paper on demand. Meaning you're not gonna have paper, you're going to print out paper as it's needed. And Judge Meacham and I talked about this, we still print things out that we need 
I still print out my boarding pass. I did use my mobile phone coming out here, but I had that boarding pass because I'm just not ready to trust it. And trust is one of the biggest issues. So how are you going to transition? Well, there's several different ways. You could have a chief judge of your circuit that's simply going to lay down an edict. This is it. He's going to tell the clerk whether the clerk likes it or not. This is what you're going to have to do. And everyone starts to fight because you're just being dictated to. And what Seth Madison said, especially the younger generation that's coming up, and trust me, in the clerk's office, we have a lot of that younger generation. The better practice may very well be to collaborate. It doesn't mean you're giving up the decision-making system, but you get with your chief judge and you have appointed a committee of judges who are experienced tech users and some who are not experienced tech users and sit them down when you're looking at the system to have them play with it, understand what's in it, bring in some of the top people from the clerk's office. If you have a county that the county is providing the tech support and the hard um, um, hardware to make the whole thing work, they should be involved in that process. Not that they're going to have the final say so, but they're going to be integral to the decision making process of when and how, and that vests them some ownership in the uh, process. They get some power of ownership, and you start with this committee because they're the ones that are going to have to buy into the program to then start the ball rolling to everyone else who may be very resistant to this, that this is really going to be good and have a cheerleader attitude towards it and try to explain to them why this is great. And one of the things I'll hit on after I uh, have Amy uh, present some things that she's uh, got to tell you, that in the end for the judges, it's public safety. That's the message. The more information judges have, the greater the safety of our general public is because we're informed and we're responsible for the people who get out of jail. The public holds us accountable. And for us to be accountable, we have to have the information right there for us. Amy? Um, I was going to say, so in Travis County, thanks to some um, good work of people who've been there a long time, we, we've actually been moving to electronic dockets for a long time. So it actually was 04 when our Travis County District Clerk began e-filing. So it's been going on a long time in our county on the civil and family side. Um, and then in 08, uh, basically because we, we were addressing a problem, uh, we started moving to an electronic docket system where the judges had an e-docket viewer of the DMS system. It was called e-docket. Many of you might have used it. How many of you do have, use electronic dockets in any way now? Do it. And how many of you are still on all paper? Okay. Some hybrid, most of you? Most of you are trying to take a siesta before the day ends. But, um, so what, what I, so what happened in 08 was, there was, a, we had a, a big personality of our uh, local administrative judge who pushed this, and he really did push it on some very resistant district court judges at the time. They were not a fan. Our deputy is here from the district clerk's office, and she is uh, reliving this, I'm sure, in her head. But they were not fans of moving to this system. And I will tell you, by, by those naysayers being collaborators in the system, they are now some of the biggest proponents. Again, they don't want to know anything about the technology. They just want it to work for them. Um, but they were naysayers. They did say they were never going to use an electronic docket. They would always want the paper. Um, and they now are dependent on this electronic system. And now we're using the smart bench system. And when they see it, they're just now in these last two weeks um, have just started now utilizing the system where I've been piloting it for a while. But we're getting great responses from them because the, it's so speedy. Um, they can do <coughs> searches that they never imagined. It has a lot of functionality for the end user um, and it's very user friendly. Um, but uh, I guess what I, the main point I wanted to make is when you're implementing these systems is the main thing is you may have a lot of reasons for doing it. One, as court managers and court clerks, it may just be that, God help you, you can't do anything else anymore with e-filing, or the cost savings alone is the reason you're doing it. But I think judges, as self-centered people, and people who like things to work for us, we need to be told, and it is true, by the way, that this is going to make our lives easier. It's going to make our rulings better. It's going to make access to information for us quicker 
and more accurate, more reliable, more efficient. For a new judge like me, I am able to look at similar cases or I'm able to send an email to my judges and say to them, um, have any of you ever had a case like the one I'm seeing? And they're able to respond and I'm able to find that case. And so I'm able to look at something that has come up before and not be reinventing the wheel um, for the very first time. And that is an incredible comfort um, and something that I think that judges really need to understand that this can do for us and make us better judges if we're using it effectively. And I think that's important because there's a lot of reasons why you do this. But at the end of the day, judges who are resistant are going to it are going to say, no way, because at the end of the day, I make the decisions, and I'm the one making the rulings, and I'm the one who the justice system depends on. And so you need to really make them understand that it can help them do their job better, not just a mandate from the Office of Court Administration or something like that, but that it really can work for them. And in Texas, I will tell you, uh, I know David Slayton is the president of this organization, but we have actually, our Texas Supreme Court has mandated e-filing in Texas, and the large counties are already under that order, and it's phasing in the smaller counties, all 254 over the next five years. And there's a lot of grumbling, but this is how things are going to be. Um, and it, it, um, it's just how life is going to be. So judges are going to have to adjust. But I do think it's important that they understand the things that it can help them and do for them. Likewise, in Florida, um, Chief Justice Polston, um, when he became Chief Justice two years ago, said, we're going to e-filing. We had talked about the portal. In fact, one of the participants in the initial meetings where we um, went to Denver and talked about um, Mentis and AI SmartBench, uh, he's in charge of the statewide portal. And we all had questions. How is this going to work or whatever? Well, ultimately, with the Manatee model and Santa Rosa County, Justice Polston was convinced that this, we're ready. We are ready. And he mandated, as the Chief Justice, with the approval, of course, of the other judges, uh, electronic filing, which has also become mandated. And we just opened up uh, pro se litigants to be able to e-file. And there's a lot of grumbling. Uh, the younger attorneys don't seem to have much of a problem with it. Uh, the help desk for the portal was overwhelmed at first, but that's a natural consequence. Uh, and there's a statewide technology committee that gives advice to the Florida Supreme Court. Um, so it's here, it's coming, and uh, you have to prepare for it. And uh, what we want to talk about is some of the things now that you should think about in preparing for it, and also how does this work? What is this AI smart bench or other court viewers? What does it do exactly? Well, as many of you know, we have a case management system, which is everything but documents. And then we have the document management system that sits next to that. And everyone's got little different systems. Manatee County and many of the counties in Florida are using Clericus. Uh, some are using other case management systems. Uh, it's called CMS, case management, DMS, document management. It's a document management side that's the part that everyone was very much concerned about when we started talking about a new type of court viewer because we're not talking about millions of documents, we're talking about tens of millions of documents that have to be uploaded into the system so that they're there. And then how are they protected? What happens if they get the blue screen of death? And these were serious questions, so we wanted to make sure that we got uh, specific assurances of the reliability of the system. And I asked the clerk, where are you backing up all of your, your data in the clericus system? And I said, I sure hope you've got more than one place. And we do, I think we've got three around the country that are the repositories for the backup system. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that you want to make sure is that you have an adequate hardware base. Uh, we had a problem with the system not working speedily because speed is a key for any court viewer system. Uh, <clears throat> we had a problem because the system was crashing. We were getting error messages, it wasn't loading. And when we did, went and had our IT people along with Mentis investigate what the problem was, the problem was that our servers that supplied the data to all the courts in Manatee County were in a room that wasn't properly cooled and ventilated. And the batteries of the devices were failing. 
And so the system wasn't producing. So you've got all these different things. So the, we went to the county and we said, you need to move your IT servers to a different place, which they did quite readily because they're very interested in making sure that this works, and put it into a, a, cool, a cool place. You have to have an IT staff from the people that run the signal, from the servers. You have to have a dedicated IT staff that are personable and nice and friendly, you know, and don't say, what did you do now? But are there lickety split to be able to identify the problem, to determine is it a county supply problem? Is this a problem with Mentis? Um, how do we solve this problem? And I, I forgot to mention this earlier, but the key part of, of implementing the electric docketing, electronic docketing system in 08 for the Travis County Courts was we did, in fact, um, hire an, a full complement of IT staff to support. And we didn't just go to electronic dockets, we went to electronic courtrooms. Every judge had a computer, there are computer screens at every council table, there is IT equipment that have a computer for electronic evidence in every courtroom with screens up on the big screen in front of the jury, at the witness box, at the judge's bench, council table, and even one more um, to be the end user to be using electronically. Um, and that was important. I, when In the civil and family cases that we do in Travis County, just to put it in perspective, since we are the state capital, we also have huge government cases. Um, and one case, for example, is a school finance lawsuit brought on behalf of 700 school districts alleging that the school finance system, the way it's funded in the state of Texas, is unconstitutional. And I have 10 judges who do what, what we do, and one of my fellow judges has this case. It has, you know, over 5 million pages of pleadings. It has 750 or 800 exhibits. Um, and you can imagine if you were trying to do that with paper, how incredibly, I mean, it just, it's just really not possible. And so the only way to do it where you're not making a seven week trial, a seven year trial is really with electronic evidence and being able to not have to go through notebooks after notebook after notebook, but being able to pull up plaintiff's exhibit 84 um, just with the click of a button or uh, things like that. So we have full IT staff and we um, have really, I think, understood that that is a necessary thing. When part of what happened in 08 was understanding that with these big cases that have such large um, numbers of pages, <coughs> remember I don't speak in bits and bytes, so I don't know what that would be, but um, millions of pages of cases and numerous parties that you have to have um, an electronic docketing system or you would just be spending all your time telling some poor deputy clerk Oh no, go, just, there's just one clerk would just constantly, that's pretty much what happens on this case anyway. So you'd probably have five clerks uh, if you didn't have electronic docketing, just constantly on a rotating basis, going back down, searching some file somewhere for a specific pleading or motion in this case. Uh, I put up on the board, I'm not gonna go into it deeply, but there is help. Write this down. Center for Legal and Court Technology is a joint project of William & Mary Law School set it up by Professor uh, Fred Lederer and the National Center for State Courts. The National Center, which is here, they have a presence in your conference. They are there to assist local jurisdictions in any way to help with what you're doing in your court system. They're very accessible. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they have uh, a, essentially a 2025 courtroom that they have developed uh, with monies that they have gotten through endowments or other sources to test out new technology to see how it works. Everything from touchscreen um, um, panels to um, um, video uh, testimony from long distance. Uh, and Professor Lederer and his uh, team have made various presentations to the National Center for State Courts. It's extremely interesting. Getting back to what your needs are, we talked about having a uh, good, strong IT department, having the hardware in the proper place, having a good, speedy internet signal. Today, uh, the internet signal here is two megabits. Sorry, I used that geek language. But you, you, you want to have a lot more than that. Verizon's selling uh, 60 megabits for your home in order to stream Netflix and the like. When you get a lot of users, which we have a lot of users, users in this building, the signal degrades. So you want to make sure that you have a good, strong signal. Uh, to make sure that it gets there. Clerk's office, 
you're talking about paper coming in from pro se litigants or from attorneys. Florida just requires now all the attorneys to electronically file, but you have paper coming in. This means two or three, maybe more, massive copiers with a dedicated staff who are going to quickly and promptly copy by scanning all the documents in, and they have to be trained to make sure that they uh, scan them in in the proper order of things so that when you look at them uh, on a court viewer, you can uh, readily determine when you're the judge what the order of things is. Exhibits should be in numbers and the like. Then the second component of that is that you have to have several clerks who are receiving the electronic files and the scanned in documents. They have to make sure that it's going to be docketed into the right file electronically, and they have to make sure that they give appropriate docket names for each of the documents that's filed. You know, the old days was the judge would do an order. And what was the title? Order. Well, you've got a case like Judge Clark Meacham was talking about, and you go in that court file to look for an order, you're not gonna find it. You're not, and you're not gonna tap each one. And so that's part of the training for the clerks, also for the judges, because the judges produce orders, you have to identify on the top of your order what you want the docket entry to say so that it's very, very clear uh, what's going on. So all of this, the working with the judges and the clerks requires a, a, a real-time interaction, as Mr. Madison said this morning, in order to get the right result. And in Manatee County, we have a very fast track for evictions, and it is not uncommon at all that documents, especially when you've got a long weekend, and then you've got illness in the clerk's office that a document that might come in the day before the 4th of July on Friday won't show up in your computer until Tuesday or Wednesday. Well, quite frankly, that's not acceptable. Some of the, there's some goods and some bads, and these are some of the things, the human element that's involved in electronic filing cannot be overlooked. Right, well, well you're setting up your uh, system to show them how it works. I just wanna say one thing, there are gonna be hiccups, obviously. You know, there will be, um, sometimes where for whatever reason the system goes down for five minutes or for ten minutes um, there will be a reason every once in a while that something's not in the file usually that's a human reason um, because a lawyer put the wrong cause number on a case and therefore it got filed in the wrong case or a clerk or a judge made a mistake on something they did so usually you can't always take the human element out of it but I, I do say the the biggest fear of people who have some fear of technology, which I think all of us do, is that they aren't secure. Or somehow if they're on this system, they aren't gonna be, they're gonna be manipulable, right? That somehow, somehow this system, because we don't understand it, is gonna be more problematic than the paper system. I would just simply say to you that before we went to an electronic docket, the way I got the court file as a lawyer in Travis County, Texas, was I went to my district clerk's office, I gave them my bar card, and they gave me the entire file. And I took it with me to a cubby somewhere in the courthouse. I mean, they wanted me to stay there. And I suppose I was under the honor system, but if a pro se litigant, I assume they took their driver's license back in the time, but they're public records, and you couldn't tell these people they couldn't have access to a file that's a public record. But what does that person do with that public record? How is that a more secure system that I could just sit there and shove things in my jacket or shove them in my briefcase and just literally pilfer the official court record? Um, I mean, so every system is manipulable. Um, and I would posit to you that this system, the, the new DMS systems that are electronic, the new e-filing systems, they are a heck of a lot more secure than any old system ever was where anybody could come and pick the court file from a public record from the district clerk. And at least unless you had a police officer or guard deputy standing over every single person could do something with that file. The current systems are vulnerable as we found out much to everyone's unhappiness some months back, a couple conspirators came up with an enterprising idea. They got an order for the release of a defendant that an actual judge had signed. They were able to make a copy of that, change the style of the case, forge the judge's name, put it in the clerk's inbox, and they were released. Not for long, and there was quite a furor over that because there was no verification process. 
Now the Florida Supreme Court has mandated that any time there's an order to release someone from prison, and these were serious felony offenders, that that has to be verified. The clerk has to contact the judge that supposedly signed it to make sure the judge sees it, that the judge says, yes, I did sign that, and that is a correct order. Um, so that just points up some of the um, um, failings of our current system. Um, we have brought up here, this is the agenda view for AI Smart Bench. This is my violations of probation docket from last week. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a tour. But uh, back in 2007, 2008, when we first started talking to Mentis, I went out to Denver, Colorado, met with Jim Downham, who's the uh, physicist, who basically is the inventor of a lot of this uh, software. Uh, Mentis had previously uh, come up with a fantastic software called AI Redact, which electronically read documents and redacted confidential information such as bank account numbers and social security numbers, which is critical to the success of any electronic filing and then being able to release these documents electronically through a web-based application so that people could read it, such as the PACER system that some of you may know about in the, in the federal system. So after going through the, this is what we've got to have, I said, we have to have widgets. We all know Google, you've got widgets, you can personalize what we're looking at. And that we had used eDocket, just like Judge Meacham uh, had, had, and eDocket is static. It does allow you to view the cases, it has a, a way that you can search the cases, you can put notes on the cases, but it's the same for everybody. This is a system which allows you to create the view that you want. This is the agenda view, and even on the agenda view, and I'm in county court, we have here, you can see 40 violations of probation last week. When I do pretrial conferences and criminal cases once a month, I have 150 to 200 cases. Two dockets, public defender, private attorney, and then a third smaller docket, which are the consolidated traffic infractions. That's a lot of stuff. And someone comes forward and they tell you your name and I can change this. I can go ahead and hit second party and it alphabetizes everything. I can hit case number and it puts everything in the order of case number. Uh, our clerk has court appearance records that are generated by case number, but they have the ability with Clericus to revise that order as well. <clears throat> so the system is wonderful for a judge because many times I'm turning to my clerk and I say, Mavis, I'm ready. Where, where are you in this process? Because I've got the case file up. Many times when the person's name is called by whoever is calling out the names, I've got it, um, usually alphabetically, and I'll click on it. By the time they get to the podium, the case file is already there. So when Mr. Poole came up, excuse me, Mr. Patel came up, this is his VOP uh, docket entry, and I'm on a smaller screen here. I have a 22-inch Dell touchscreen before me, and it's angled so that when I have witnesses testifying, I can pull it all the way down, or I can make it completely 180 degrees vertical. But it usually sits on a 45 degree angle and it's up. And I can see this entire page here. You can't see it on this screen because we're sharing the monitor, okay? But I have the ability as a judge, whether I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona, or I'm home or in my office, to review all the cases that are coming up and I review all the, pro the violations of probation cases, at least the morning of the day of the violations of probation. And I've got tabs. There's the charging document, which I can bring up and look at. There's any uh, waivers of speedy trial, and if there are any motions, there's motions there. Usually I, I stand with the, the all tab. That can be changed, and you've got a whole list of different things that you can put in there as tabs. <clears throat> and then down below. This morning it was either cool or terrifying, depending on your perspective. <laughs> but he, uh, he signed like 16 orders in the presentation. So they've right. already been signed, and so uh, he can't do that again this afternoon, oh, unless you have more. I can't do that this no. afternoon, but down right. on the bottom of the agenda view are my files. My, these are folders. This is input court documents. So when I'm in court, saying a VOP and the person's not there, and I issue a bench warrant and set a bond, my second to the left clerk types in the bench warrant. There's a template, and she's got AI Smart Bench. She goes ahead and fills it out, transmits it to me, and while I'm still in court, before I leave, I double click it, it brings it up, and if I'm satisfied that it's correct, I hit sign, that signs the document, then I hit the refresh button, and it goes directly to the clerk 
in the document signed by Mark Singerfolder. And you see from this morning, the clerk went ahead and collected all the 16 <coughs> documents. When I'm in batch view, these are documents that I sign as a whole group. And that's what I did this morning that gave a gasp from the whole crowd. <laughs> these were final judgments for people who had entered pleas, usually get credit for time served or time in the county jail, and they're not gonna be able to pay right away, so we reduce all their financial obligations to a civil judgment. We don't review those, the clerk takes care of that. We just single click batch file. So I did 16, and from all around the room, it was like, oh. <laughs> We would, never, we would never do that, but and that would show even, you that, even Amy. That, right, yeah. no, even I was, because <laughs> I think we're in a transitional process, right? And we still use a lot of paper. So I, I don't, first off, I, I was asked this morning if I'd ever had a paper file, and I said, oh no, I want no part of ever holding a actual official court record paper file. I have three kids, I have a crazy life, my desk is where things sometimes go to die. And so I don't want the responsibility of having the paper file. Um, and I'm so glad that that's never even been in my reality, that I, that I would ever deign to take a official file out of the courthouse to my home, which is utter chaos, is terrifying for me. So I would never do that. Um, so I've never had a paper file, but I will say this, we constantly rely on the paper. So we have some judges who don't like to read documents. They don't like to read motions for summary judgment on a computer screen. Um, they either print them because we have quick access to them or the lawyers bring them. Most lawyers still in Travis County, Texas bring paper copies of their motions and they bring us a paper copy of their proposed order and we sign a paper copy of that proposed order. It gets file stamped a physical file stamped by a clerk who then scans it and makes it part of the electronic file. So there's still, what he did this morning, we're still not there yet, um, but, but we're still operating on a pretty high level with an electronic file and a very um, good system for us with where <coughs> we are, but we're still a ways away from signing and then sending back to the clerk's office for filing um, all electronically. Even I'm probably, I think I'm gonna get there, but it's, I'm still steps away probably from that. Um, other thing I should say, that the SmartBench product is not the official court record, that's still the document management system with the district clerk's office. So what it's doing functionally for the technological, technology for dummies like me is it's basically taking a picture of the DMS system every 10 minutes. So it's taking it every 10 minutes, and that's the update we're getting is basically on a 10 minute loop uh, of everything that's been filed. And so we aren't, I'm not at the point yet where I'm also then pulling up the order, signing it electronically, and sending it back for filing still with the district clerk's office. But I don't want there to be any confusion that it's the official court record what we're dealing with. For those of you that still work with paper files, you can picture this. When I started as a judge for the first several years, in order for the bench warrants to be prepared that were done in the courtroom, the clerk would take the file, create the search warrant, print out, excuse me, the bench warrant, put it on the file with a paper clip, put it in a dolly, and bring it over to the other building where I am, up to the third floor, and I come back from vacation from having done administrative criminal, and I've got stacks and stacks and stacks of warrants that are laying on the floor in multiple stacks because they've all backed up. And each file is in reverse order of the one in front of it because otherwise the whole thing would tip over. So you've got a monster to try to get everything created. I would sign it, it would go back to the clerk. The clerk would then file the original, make two copies for the sheriff's department, and then they put it in the box for the sheriff's department to get it in rounds. The sheriff's department would get it, they would then have to hand input all the data into their warrant system, and then eventually it would get to the person who's serving the warrant or sending the postcard. And in many cases, you could go four weeks from when the judge said issue a bench warrant, and people were coming to court on other matters during this four week period in county court, and no one would even know there was a bench warrant out there for them. Now, I electronically sign it the same day, the clerk gets it the same day, the clerk electronically sends it to the warrants division, and it's there. So the next day, there's a warrant outstanding that's in NCIC, FCIC. We're now starting to sign arrest warrants that are sent to the felony judges electronically, and search warrants. So
So it's a new world. Everything's starting to come uh, electronically. This is the VOP case for Mr. Patel, who I think pled out last week. Um, on April the 16th, the case was up before me the first time. I take a look at the entire court file. I made notes, this is a second DUI outside of five years. That's a critical information from the charging document because this is a serious offender because this is a second DUI. So we look at that saying, well, you know, if something's wrong here, the person's looking at a jail sentence, no question about it. So then when I see that and they come in, if they don't have a lawyer, the first question I'm gonna say is, why don't you have a lawyer? Because I'm sure the state wants jail time. The second thing is that there was a second addendum which meant that there was a superseding um, addendum VOP warrant. All that you need to know that because then there's two documents that have to be looked at. And then I documented what was missing. And we postponed the case. So I indicated when I looked at it the day before the hearing what was missing and what needed to be done. And then I took a snippet of the arrest warrant for the violation of probation because he was arrested in Pasco County and bonded out in Pasco County. So he's got some credit for time served and I want to, to know that. The other thing that I do is I'll do a search. This is a different gentleman. This is Vernon Poole. In Mr. Poole's case, this is his file, I click on the name Vernon Poole, and it brings up all the cases we've got open and closed. So you can see he's got some felony cases. CF is felony. Uh, and there are different segments depending upon what data we have. Sometimes we just have a date of birth. Sometimes we have a social security number. The search system is excellent. I'm gonna turn back to, oh. to Judge Meacham because uh, she has a lot to say about searching. Oh, well, a lot to say. Is that working? Well, say a lot. Okay, <laughs> well, I was gonna show you a live look in, basically, Travis County, Texas today. So I was gonna show you what we have. Well, I was gonna add one thing that um, even in Travis County where we've been doing a lot of advanced work on the civil and family side for a lot of years, that our criminal judges still operate the same way <laughs> that Judge Singer said he used to operate. So we still have a long way to go with convincing them even that the electronic uh, docketing system works for them. We're working on it and I think we're gonna get there, um, but it's still a process and there's been a lot of <coughs> resistance um, when, but now I think that mandates are coming. Some of the resistance is uh, futile at this point, as they would say. So, okay, let's live look in. This is Travis County, Texas today. Um, I don't wanna get too much into it because people get so fascinated and throw a lot of uh, questions at me and uh, look at me like I'm crazy. But basically, so 10 of us do a central docket system. And I don't even know if any of you are aware of what that is, but I have nine fellow judges and we all share the same docket. So this was a real challenge, I think, for Mentos to build our smart bench system um, because unlike most judges who every day know that control their own calendar and their own schedule, we're getting our schedule every day, maybe on a weekly basis if it's a jury trial or something, but you're learning it maybe 30 minutes before um, that case begins. So it's a lot of questions and I'll, I'll probably get some in a minute because some of it's gonna be confusing, I think. So I went to the all users so you could see what this looked like today for the 10 of us plus our five AJs. Oh, that's six AJs, but I don't know that they're all gonna be on this system. So this was the jury. You can see this is today's date. This was our 901 docket this morning and we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven jury trials that were announced, and these are the judges that got them. So, for example, uh, Judge Triana could open up this case, um, and she would have, this is all very fast, considering I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I'm in my system in Travis County. So imagine, it's even quicker when I'm sitting at my bench in Travis County. And this is the case that she got, the cause number, the plaintiff and the defendant, the lawyers, all the pleadings right here. Um, you could click on any of them if you wanted to find. We have these tabs that they've created for us based on information we've given them. Um, petitions and pleas, um, here are the answers, here are the orders. And so if you wanted to look at there, there have not been any, so this looks like a pretty standard case. Uh, may even be a car wreck case. And you notice she has different tabs and a different agenda yeah. view than I do because all of this is customizable. It's all customizable even within our system, which is a central docket system, like I just said. Each judge 
develops their own way they see this, their own viewer. So this is the way I like to see it, but it may not be how other judges like a to see it. A funny anecdote, I'm a power user, which means I can change my view instead of asking for help. And when you go to save, which is uh, down on the bottom over oh, you can't, I can't see here, this. save, I get any viewer views this case, so it'll change that view to all the viewers. Well, I didn't read it really carefully. And I was saving everything in that view and my IT guy came to me and says, Mark, what are you doing? You're changing everyone's customized view. I'm like, oh, Oops. oh my God. <laughs> so I want to show you, so this was the family docket this morning, which we go off at 835. And like I said, we're, we share a family and a central docket. So it looks like I'm there. That's actually the visiting judge who was sitting for me this morning, um, <coughs> Judge Covington. And this was the case that she got. And so at this morning, she got this case. Um, here were the parties in that case. She was able to look at, oh, the pleadings, any pleading that she wanted to. Um, and you can pull up the case. Like I said, we're working pretty quickly. And so um, I'm trying to make y'all be able to see it. So because we just have a little bit of time before we actually start our cases. But she can you know, review the case history, really, on a quick basis kind of going around between each of the documents she thinks that would be helpful. Um, obviously, if we're on a non-jury docket and you have motions before you, whether those are discovery motions or motions for summary judgment, you can pull those up. You can read them on the screen. Or if you still <laughs> don't like to read on the screen, you can print those out and read them on the printed page. That includes all um, anything in the file. And it comes up very, very quick. Uh, I want to show you, for example, one of the things that you can do uh, is you can go back and look at previous days and what you were doing on any day um, of the year. So I, I was looking um, before I went on vacation the week of June 23rd, what I did that day. Oh, and I'm still at all users, but I can go here. And if you don't like all the clutter, and most people don't, um, and most of you, when you have your own solo dockets, you won't need to see what anybody else is doing. Uh, we sometimes need to because of the unique central docket that we have. But I can just pull me up and I can see, oh, this was the case that I had that day. Um, click on it. And this was a very, um, it's a high conflict family case. And I can identify that pretty quickly because the way I have my viewer set up, and I've had to mess with it a little bit just because of the size of the screen here, is I can go through and scroll through, oh, look at all the judges' notes by all the different judges over the course of three years. And we're all talking about all of the issues that this family has who's come to us on numerous hearings over the course of two or three years. And each one sort of uh, is a note to the next judge that sort of gives the next judge, oh, um, here's what's going on here, you know, allegations of sexual abuse by both sides against the other, a in and out CPS um, system. They've been in and out of CPS. One of the kids is in the juvenile system now. So it's just every kind of issue you can think of. But, but and one of these things that it's become very um, important for us on the central docket system, because the big problem that everybody always says that the central docket system would have is obviously you wouldn't have the institutional knowledge on the case each time the case comes back. Well, electronic docketing has helped us with that, because we leave each other pretty long, involved notes about our views on the case, uh, what happened in the hearings that we had. And so that has been corrected in a lot of ways. Um, I'll have a longer discussion with anybody who wants to have it about the central docket system, because we love it in Travis County. The judges love it, the lawyers love it, and there are some naysayers, but in general, it's an incredibly efficient system that works really quickly. But just my, um, basically, this is to say, if it can work for us in the crazy amount of information that you can imagine between 10 different judges sharing a docket, family, civil, CPS, juvenile, government cases, and government appeals, it can work um, for judges with individual dockets. Could I have that yep. back? One of the things that I mentioned early on is public safety. All the judges in Manatee County do what we call first appearances. These are the people who were arrested on day one and on day two they're coming up before a judge either because they couldn't bond out, either a cash or a surety bond, or 
they're charged with a crime involving um, violence to a person, domestic violence, domestic battery, there's no bond, they must see a judge. And the judge has to make an inquiry and then determine what the appropriate uh, pretrial release is given whatever the factors are. And this is the scary part of being a judge, is you don't know who you've got. You've got to get whatever information you can. Florida has, on top of all of this, the Florida Supreme Court, which is handled through the Office of State Court Administrator, OSCA, a judicial inquiry system, which is a separate program that was developed by Metatomics, which gives the judge all that information. Uh, and so when a person comes before me, I've got Metatomics up that gives me juvenile records, all the clerk's records from 67 counties, um, all the family DR cases, that's domestic relation cases, whether there's any hot files. A hot file is a term used throughout the nation by the law enforcement agencies that either there's an injunction for protection that the person has been ordered not to do, or there's a, a warrant for their arrest here in Florida or elsewhere. And many times I'm viewing this, and the first thing I look to see is Department of Corrections records. And you've got it right there. You've got a picture of the person. I can see him on video or her, and I can verify with my own eyes whether I'm talking about the same person. And if they've got a Department of Corrections record, first thing I'm going to say to the defendant is, are you on probation or parole from the state of Florida? If the answer is yes, you're going to have a warrant for your arrest for violation of probation. The system sends an electronic message to the probation officer, and the warrant application is going to go to the judge within a few days. That makes a big difference on whether I'm going to let this person out. I can't arrest them for violation of probation. That's not my, my job. But I can make sure for the protection of the public that the bond is sufficiently high to make sure that this individual is not going to get out until the warrant is executed. Worst case scenario, I just continue the matter with no bond for another hearing before me later in the week to make sure that we have it. And I turn to the state attorney and I say, Mr. State Attorney, make sure that you contact the probation department to let them know secondarily that the person's wanted. Uh, sometimes I see that a person is wanted out of state in Austin, Texas, right? Well, I can, I can look at that and then I'll say to the deputy sheriff, how come this person isn't here today on an extradition? Well, the answer usually is because you've got local pending charges. I said, well, I need to know whether or not Texas is going to extradite. We're going to carry it over tomorrow because I want to make sure there's a Texas hold. So no matter what happens on this case, the person's not leaving. They'll come back on an extradition hearing in Manatee County because we don't want to lose anybody in the system. And these are very serious public safety responsibilities. When I have someone come up for first appearances for a domestic battery, and I hear the state attorney say, there have been several prior domestic batteries, those have been dropped, I immediately go to AI Smart Bench, which is already lit up, type in the person's name in the person search um, area, and look them up, or her up, and then I can see all these closed cases. Well, what am I looking for? I'm looking to see who the victim is. What's the nature of the violence? Some of you may very well know from um, your, your work that there's a circle of violence. It tends to start small and then it escalates. And the violence escalates. So what, what am I dealing with here? Am I dealing with a first offender or am I dealing with someone who's beating up their, their other significant partner on a regular basis and that person's asking the charges to be dropped? I can't control whether that charge is gonna be filed or not, but I can make sure that there's some protection. And sometimes the victim is in court and they're saying, I don't want to prosecute. So we have a dialogue. Did the police talk to you about your right to get a, a, an injunction against domestic violence? All I know is I want him home. So, well, that's up to the state attorney. But we're setting a high bond and I'm going to order no contact with you until the state attorney makes a decision. If there's other cases that are still pending, I look at that case to see whether the state has filed. If the state has filed the case, I announce it in court that the other battery charge has been filed, your arraignment is scheduled for August the 16th, and under the authority vested in the judges by the Florida legislature, I'm hereby revoking your bond on the earlier case, and you're gonna be held without bond till trial. Boom, you're not getting out at all. And some people aren't aware of that, they go a little bit upset. What do you mean? It's only a battery. I said, you committed a new law violation while you're out on bond, you're not getting out of jail. And I tell everyone, do not commit a new law violation because the judges will find out because we've got access. And there's nothing that the persons who are regular visitors to our criminal justice system, the last thing they want is for that judge who they've never seen before to know everything about. Because that's what they're hoping is, that they're just going to slide through the system. And some of these people, Florida's got a very poor track record, some of these people have slid through the system and some really 
really horrendous and bad things have happened. And I don't want to open the paper the next morning, the paper paper, <laughs> and you see on, online. You open yeah, it online. who let this person out. They're not talking about the state attorney. They're talking about the judge that did it. You may know we have a judge recently, a couple days ago, released the former chief of police in one of our uh, larger communities who killed the person, shot him in the movie theater over him continuing to text message. So the judge set a bond after a long period of time. They didn't go into the details. But those are the, the hard decisions that judges have to make because you don't want to feel responsible. The only way to, to manage that is to have this kind of a component. What you're looking at here briefly are the different agenda dockets for, I've got one here, that's the one we're looking at. <coughs> I created another one for violations of probation. Judge Brunel does uh, delinquency and dependency. He's got his own docket view. And even myself, when I set these up, I have John Shunk from our IT department come in and sit down at my desk and say, John, I want you to work through me on this. This is what I want to see in that, so help me out. And sometimes I have to call Renee Smith, who's our trial clerk supervisor. She knows all the codes because you have to have the clerk's code numbers in order to set it up properly. And they'll work, you th work me through it. And then I'll use that docket until someday I get, just like we all do with our Google or AOL, you get tired of the view. So I'm sitting there one afternoon going, mm, I think I'll go change my view today. You know, so I start messing around in the system and more often than not I have to call John. Uh, John, I don't know what I did here, but you're the expert, you need to come back and, and help me out. The last screen I have here. I was, just while you're doing that, one thing is too, on the civil side, obviously it's not, um, always the public safety issue but since we deal with them domestic violence issues as well I mean sometimes in a family law case I do I do people searches all the time on our system because you will have people who you put you search by their name and it pulls up their last domestic violence protective order their you know their other case with their other previous wife where they also didn't pay child support for their kids and you know you wouldn't have that information if you didn't have access to it and I like to know I mean I never understand a world where you want less information and not more I want to have as much information as I can to rule properly um, bef on on the people before me because I don't want that in the paper um, about how I didn't do my job and my due diligence to know the technology you know the American Bar Association now and their new model rules um, requires every lawyer, if, if the states adopt these, to actually be, um, uh, to know the technology of the day. And so, even though we may, may never be techno technological experts, I think it's incumbent upon us to do our jobs, to do the same thing that the ABA requires for lawyers to know the technology, for us to also be able to know the technology enough to make sure we're not missing information just because we don't want to learn it because it's difficult and because it's hard. And so um, I like knowing more, not less. And I think that having access to electronic docketing um, is important for that. One thing, too, is when I, I'm a brand new judge and people are trying to take advantage of me, go figure. Who would have ever thought that? Um, but we have an individual in Austin, Texas, and he likes to, I promise you, he likes to buy property, get mortgages. I don't know how he got mortgages from all these different places, and then not pay his mortgage and on like, uh, like 20 different properties, and then sue them before they sue him because he's trying to basically make a policy point about the current state of uh, law in the state of Texas. And after he came to me the second time, and I thought, this guy seems familiar. Boy, this case seems familiar. But no one was kind of giving me the heads up. I do a search on him, and there I find all 25 cases that this one fellow has basically arguing the exact same thing before, you know, all 10 of us probably at one point had had him. But we each hadn't had him enough to kind of remember him. But you look at it, and you're making sure on our central docket it's really important that we're making consistent rulings as well. Uh, maybe you disagree with a fellow judge, but you have a good reason for that, but you're able to research that and know more information, not less, and I think that's always a good thing. Three separate distinct items. First, you're looking at this screen. These are templates for orders that the JA and the clerk can send to the judge, and we had uh, all the judges submit uh, orders that could be created into a template for ease of use electronically. Um, second, uh, when we set up our committee, 
uh, for the review of uh, SmartBench before we deployed it. We had both very experienced users and inexperienced users. And Judge Dunnigan, who was one of those who really said, I don't know anything about computers. I can't even remember my passwords. Well, when we set her up, I didn't do it. When IT set her up in the courtroom with the clerk, she got a second monitor. And every VOP, violation of probation, that came up, the court clerk brought up the affidavit of violation of probation. So it was right there. And all of a sudden, she says, all I got to do is turn my head and know what the problem is with the case. She says, I'm liking this. And she became a complete convert because these systems are set up that it can be controlled by the clerk for the judge, by the JA for the judge. And it gives the judge information and makes their, their time run faster. But we're really at the, uh, the end of our time. Any questions, last questions? I don't see any. Um, if you do have questions that you'd like to come up, we uh, have been told by Mentis that if everyone wants to go to room 7015 immediately following this from 5 to 8, uh, myself and Judge uh, Clark Meacham will be there and we can demonstrate the system and answer any other questions. There's, I think there's food and drink too, so it wouldn't just be us talking to you some more. They are uh, feeding you. Thank you for coming. Have a great day.